In my estimation, video game sequels are usually better than the original games. Games are built on repeatable mechanical experiences, and they benefit massively from iteration. This isn't true of more narratively focused art forms. We've all seen movie sequels that hew too close to the original. But when a creative game development team has the chance to refine and build on their successes, amazing things can happen. That's the story of Batman Arkham City, a superior game to the first in nearly every way. Popular consensus says this is the best of the series. It's really tough to debate that, even if I wanted to. I don't. I agree. That actually makes it a little harder to talk about. The other sequels are fraught with more serious issues and contentious choices, which are great fodder for analysis and debate. What can you say about Arkham City that isn't basically, it's a bigger and better Arkham Asylum? I could end this right now with that simple conclusion. But when you dig in, there is more to the story. This game deserves to be appreciated up close. The elements that make it the strongest Batman game yet are worth examining. And yet, Arkham City, like everything, isn't without its shortcomings. We'll explore those as well. After Arkham Asylum, Rocksteady could have gone anywhere with the sequel. There was no direct storyline suggested by the end of the first game. The most logical follow-up was to take the action into Gotham itself, a bigger stage for a bigger play. That's kind of what they did. Arkham City isn't Gotham City, not exactly. It's a walled-off portion of old Gotham repurposed as an open-air prison. All the city's inmates from Arkham Asylum and Blackgate Penitentiary are moved there. Street-level thugs to supervillains are all in one neighborhood. It's an absurd premise, but one that feels right at home in the heightened reality of the Arkham universe. It does sound like something that could have happened for very similar reasons in the comics. In fact, elements of Arkham City and the next Rocksteady game, Arkham Knight, are inspired by the No Man's Land comic storyline. Like the Titan plot in the first game, the Arkham City concept is a contrivance for gameplay purposes. The name, on the other hand, is a contrivance for marketing. Arkham Asylum is a well-established location within the Batman canon. Arkham City is something Rocksteady made up because they needed to let the masses know that this game was directly connected to that good Batman game, and you should buy this one. Batman isn't a specific enough brand, so they got stuck with shoehorning the word Arkham into every title, which is clunky and silly, but not actually detrimental. Technically, the game takes place in a prison, just like the first, but because of the Arkham City conceit, it's aesthetically closer to Gotham proper. All the same benefits that applied to the prison setting in Arkham Asylum also apply here. It provides a logically confined space for the action and an excuse for Batman to fight a broad cross-section of villains all in one night. The prison setting also removed the complication of having to create a fully living, breathing Gotham with non-combatant citizens, traffic, and all of the other things you expect in urban open world games. In fact, every Arkham game following this found some excuse to get the regular citizens out of the city. In a way, Arkham City is the best of both worlds, prison and urban landscape. Gotham was shown briefly in Arkham Asylum's opening cutscene, and throughout the game it existed as a distant skybox lingering in the background. That low detail backdrop depicted a generic modern city, with the only obvious landmark being the Wayne Enterprises building. The sequel provides our first up-close glimpse of the Arkham vs. Gotham City, and it displays quite a bit more character. The boxy skyscrapers have been replaced by a skyline composed of towers in Art Deco, New Classical, and Gothic Revival styles. There is some continuity with the first game, as the Wayne Enterprises building retains the same appearance. The asylum itself is also visible in the distance, still overgrown with poison ivy's plants. This gives a nice sense of place and continuity to even the distant backdrop of the game. The closest on-screen equivalent is probably Tim Burton's Gotham City, as seen in the 1989 Batman film and its 1992 sequel, Batman Returns, which in turn inspired the look of Gotham in Batman the Animated Series. Like those other portrayals of Batman's hometown, this version of Gotham has an oddly anachronistic style. Aesthetic inspiration comes from many different eras, 
Wonder Tower, which features heavily in the game, is inspired by structures built for World's Fair exhibitions, famous landmarks like the Eiffel Tower or the Space Needle. The variety of styles gives Gotham an implied history and also a sense of timelessness. That history is partially explored in the Wonder City segment of the game, where you traverse an underground portion of Old Gotham. These long-forgotten buildings and streets mimic the actual development of cities like Seattle and Chicago, which were heavily regraded in places, leaving half-buried buildings underground. More than just a setting, Gotham City is a character in Batman stories. It symbolizes what Batman is fighting against and what Batman is fighting for. The distant towers of Gotham stand as a direct contrast to the worn down, burnt out buildings that comprise Arkham City. Arkham City is old Gotham, once a thriving, beautiful place, then a seedy neighborhood, now an actual prison. This cycle represents a possible dark future for the whole metro area. Arkham City contains a number of landmarks, but most significant to Bruce Wayne is Crime Alley, the spot behind the Monarch Theater where his parents were killed. Fittingly, the Monarch Theater will again host a significant event in Bruce Wayne's life during the events of Arkham City. Despite how run down and monochrome many of the buildings are, they're far from generic. The layout of Arkham City is distinct and full of character. Although it's easy to miss as you go about Batman business, there's a ton of detail in the cityscape and lots of fun references to Batman lore. As many times as I've played this game, I feel like I always discover some new detail each time. In 2011, Arkham City was called an open world game in contrast to the first, but after playing it again, I don't entirely agree with that label. Arkham City is much bigger than Asylum. The overworld map is no longer rigidly segmented into three portions like Arkham Island in the first game. But in terms of structure and the time it takes to get from place to place, it's not all that different. Arkham City is functionally closer to its predecessor than to contemporary sandbox games like Skyrim, Grand Theft Auto, or Assassin's Creed. It isn't really an open world in the way that we use that term now, where it's synonymous with massive maps or sprawling site activities and icon-marked busy work. If you walk around Arkham City on foot, it seems vast and you can get lost in it, but that's not how you'll spend most of your time getting around. Your primary method of transit has a lot to do with perceptual world size. The biggest functional difference in the overworld design of Asylum and City is how you get around. In the first game, you could glide and were required to do so in a few places, but mostly you ran around on foot. Arkham City lets you fly. It lets you fly continuously if you're skilled enough. It feels so freeing, so exhilarating, leaping off a ledge, gliding over the city, weaving through buildings, and swooping down on enemies. This is the most joyous new addition to the gameplay. You can get between the two most distant points on the map in a little over two minutes. That's much, much faster than you can cross, say, Skyrim. In Arkham Asylum, you'd mostly run between destinations. A full circuit of the Asylum on foot takes about the same amount of time as a flight across Arkham City. My point is that the difference between the two games is largely perceptual. Some people seem to think that Arkham Asylum is a tight Metroidvania, while Arkham City is an open world. But they're not very different functionally. Put another way, Arkham City has an open world, but it is not an open world game. The bulk of Arkham Asylum took place inside buildings, which broke up the game into chapters or segments. In between, you'd pass through the Asylum's courtyard while traveling to the next interior space. While you were there, you might collect a Riddler trophy or two and fight some enemies, but then you'd go back into another building or underground tunnel system to the real meat of the game. Arkham City is structurally the same, but now the courtyard is a neighborhood. While the structures might be similar, the effect is very different. Arkham Asylum was claustrophobic and creepy like a haunted house. Arkham City has a sort of oppressive Orwellian vibe on top of extreme urban decay. Helicopters circle overhead, surveillance cameras watch the inmates, high walls and machine gun turrets keep everyone, including you, inside. You might be locked in a prison, this time with even more inmates, but the feelings of foreboding and dread from Arkham Asylum are gone. Arkham City is no brighter or happier a game than its predecessor, but it is a lot less macabre. The horror elements aren't nearly as pronounced. 
In the first game, you fought the criminally insane. A lot of the inmates were working for the Joker, but I got the impression that they didn't have much loyalty except to violence and chaos. Running wild outside their cells, killing with impunity, was all the reward that they needed. In Arkham City, the focus is more on organized crime, especially with villains like Two-Face and the Penguin, who are motivated by good old-fashioned greed. The street-level criminals you fight typically work for one of the main supervillains. These people seem bad and desperate, but not unhinged, and that gives off a whole different tone than the villains of the first game. They're more mundane sort of criminals, even if they do wear silly outfits indicating their loyalties. The amount of time you spend gliding in this game also substantially changes the feel. In the overworld, you can always grapple away and be flying within seconds. You're not confined by the ceilings and cramped interiors of the asylum. Even in Arkham City's interior spaces, there's more opportunity for gliding. There's almost always high ground available to you that's off limits to enemies. Personally, I'll take the increased mobility any day. But that, combined with the change of setting, pretty much destroys the feeling of being stuck in a confined space with the worst of Gotham. To borrow a phrase from Watchmen, in Arkham Asylum, you were locked in with the criminals, but in Arkham City, they're locked in with you. Arkham City is where the series really hit its stride with the gameplay. There's not one or two major changes that demonstrate this. The free flow combat is largely the same, and so are the basic mechanics of stealth encounters. It's a bunch of small improvements and additions that add up to a much better overall experience. One critique of Asylum's combat is that it requires little skill. All you have to do is press the counter button and the enemies can never touch you. That's not really true, especially as you progress farther. And it's certainly not true of the stealth encounters. But Arkham City adds some much needed refinement and complexity to the combat without spoiling its approachability. The essential language of four main actions, strike, counter, dodge, and stun, is preserved. Combat is a bit faster on the whole. Enemies are more aggressive. They generally come in larger numbers, often outfitted with weapons and items that make fights dynamic. Batman can now counter multiple enemies at once. It happens often, and it's consistently satisfying. Thrown objects can now be countered and thrown back instead of just dodged. It was often too simple to maintain a chain of constant attacks in the first game. Specially outfitted enemies are good at throwing you off your rhythm and knocking you out of free flow, which makes the whole combat system more challenging and it's more rewarding when you're able to maintain that flow state. In addition to knives, guns, and stun batons returning from Arkham Asylum, City adds shields and armored enemies, both of which require special moves to attack. Shielded enemies can't be countered, only dodged, making them extra dangerous in a group. An aerial attack combo is required to open them up. Armored enemies are engaged with a beatdown, a stun followed by a rapid series of strikes, which if completed will knock out the enemy. While it's necessary for these enemies, both moves can be used on almost anyone, and they're useful for adding variation bonuses and building your combo meter. Titan enhanced brutes return as mini bosses. Rather than waiting for them to become vulnerable by charging into a wall, you must rapidly stun them three times, called an ultra stun, and then begin a beatdown. This requires you to be more aggressive in these encounters. Instead of waiting for the enemy, you have to be proactive, which is more dangerous, more challenging, and more fun. Arkham City expands the use of gadgets during combat. In addition to batarangs and the bat claw, you can also quick fire explosive gel, electrical charges, and the freeze blast. These are all helpful tools to give you some breathing room in larger brawls. Later fights with diverse enemy types require greater levels of strategy, execution, and spatial awareness than ever before. The flow of melee combat can change at any moment between being proactive and reactive to enemy behavior. You'll get into a flow and then get interrupted by a special enemy type or a mistake. And then you'll have to use your combat knowledge and ability to get back the upper hand. Longer battles mean your mistakes are more costly. They require more endurance than before. This pushes the player to hone their skills instead of allowing them to scrape by with sloppy or lazy play. In Predator encounters, Batman is a bit faster and more nimble than before. There are more contextual options. Batman can perform takedowns using vents, windows, ledges, 
wooden walls, and crates. There's more use of the environment and more variety to these segments, which is very welcome. In Arkham Asylum, detective mode and vantage points could easily become a crutch for players. Two new enemy types are designed to disrupt that. Signal jammers can interfere with detective mode until you take them out. Enemies equipped with heat vision goggles scan for Batman hiding above. In a few encounters, enemies will take hostages. If you're seen, they'll be executed and you'll fail the encounter. These new enemy types and behaviors add some welcome additional pressure and variety to predator mode engagements, but don't shake things up as much as the free flow combat. Things are still fundamentally in your favor, and there's not all that much pressure to mix up your strategies. Still, this aspect of the game remains strong, and thanks to better controls and a more responsive character, they're a lot more fun to play. Batman's arsenal of gadgets is similar to the first game. Most items return, and those that don't aren't missed because their functionality is rolled into an existing gadget or wasn't broadly useful to begin with. The new gadgets usually have combat, traversal, and puzzle-solving functions, such as the remote electrical charge or the freeze blast. Arkham City is the first game in the series to include playable characters besides Batman. There was a console-exclusive DLC for Arkham Asylum that featured a playable Joker, but for most of the audience, this was the first time that other playable characters were featured in an Arkham game. Catwoman during the main game, and Robin during the DLC mission Harley Quinn's Revenge. All three characters, plus Nightwing, are playable in Arkham City's bonus challenges. Alternate characters control very similarly to Batman, with slight differences in speed, power, and health. All have the same core moveset and their own versions of detective mode. Players have an immediate comfort and familiarity with any alternate character in the Arkham series because of this. Each character has unique animations and weaponry, showcasing their personality and style. The same fluid animation system that worked so well with Batman in the first game is extended to all characters. Even Nightwing, a challenge mode exclusive bonus character, has unique animations and special moves. It's clear that Rocksteady was enthusiastic about bringing more of these characters to life using the strong foundation established by the first game. They do the most with Catwoman. She's featured in three segments during the main story, and is the only alternate character to be playable in Arkham City's open world. She's got her own set of Riddler trophies to collect, and a post-game score to settle with Two-Face. Her segments provide some additional variety, but ultimately, this is very much Batman's story. One of the more surprising things about Arkham City is that it built on the plot of the first game and actually strengthened it in hindsight. Rocksteady conceived the idea for the sequel during the first game's development and announced it only a few months after Asylum's release. Arkham Asylum had a great introduction and a lame ending. Arkham City is kind of the opposite. The intro isn't terrible, but it's pretty messy. Right from the start, the expanded scope and ambition is apparent as a whole lot of ideas, characters, and concepts are thrown at the player in quick succession. Asylum's intro was simple and elegant. It was a slow burn, big on atmosphere and building anticipation in the player for the moment when things went off the rails. The opening of Arkham City is confusing, disorienting, and oddly paced. It throws you into the action much more quickly, which is a welcome change, but it does so in a way that sacrifices narrative clarity. You begin not as Batman, or even Bruce Wayne, but Catwoman in a scene that has nothing to do with the story. The only reason it exists, as far as I can tell, is to introduce Catwoman and fake out players. You think that shadow from the window is Batman, but surprise, it's Catwoman, and you're controlling her. It's a cool twist, but nothing about the scene justified its inclusion at this point. It just doesn't belong here. In fact, it originally wasn't. Arkham City was released at a time when game publishers were trying some new methods to curtail the used market. It was a common practice to include a single-use code for free DLC in the box of new games, which would promote new retail sales over the second-hand market. Catwoman was part of the original game, but her content was locked behind this code. If the player didn't activate the DLC, Catwoman wouldn't be playable, and her scenes like this one were omitted. Subsequent Game of the Year and Return to Arkham editions include Catwoman and other DLC packed in. Ironically, 
I think the intro works a lot better without the Catwoman prologue. It's still confusing, but it seems more reflective of the original intent. This game was meant to start with a bang. The Catwoman scene diminishes that feeling. The true opening scene alternates between Bruce Wayne protesting Arkham City, intercut with a flash-forward conversation between Wayne and an ominous voice we later learn is Hugo Strange. In the middle of his speech, a bunch of paramilitary goons swoop in to arrest Wayne live on TV. They immediately throw him into Arkham City. No arrest, no trial, nothing. This would never happen to an extremely rich person in real life. These guys would all get sued into oblivion by a battalion of lawyers. Wayne is taken captive by Hugo Strange, psychologist and administrator of the Arkham City Project. Strange reveals that he knows Bruce's secret identity and lets on that he's planning something called Protocol 10 that he claims will make him even more of a hero than Batman. You quickly escape, do some combat as Bruce Wayne, which looks kind of ridiculous, and climb to the top of a building where you suit up, presumably not worried about anyone seeing you change into the Batsuit. And I'm just going to go ahead and assume that this kind of carelessness is the real reason Hugo Strange knows who Batman is. So in the first 10 minutes of this game, we're introduced to Catwoman, Harvey Dent, Hugo Strange, Vicki Vale, Jack Ryder, the Penguin, Tiger Security, and Arkham City itself. There are also blink and you'll miss it cameos from Black Mask and Deadshot. I know what's going on here because I've played the game so many times, but a new player? They're really being thrown into the deep end. Maybe you're meant to be a little confused and disoriented, but if not, this is poor communication. The immediate goal is also unclear. In the first game, stopping the Joker was the obvious overall objective. In Arkham City, Batman insists he can't leave until he finds out what Hugo Strange is planning with Protocol 10. That's not nearly as strong or immediate a motivation to the player. Maybe they want revenge on Strange for throwing them in prison, but you never feel like Batman is really trapped in there, even if you can't actually escape during the game. The messy intro isn't that big a deal, though. The game wastes little time getting good after that. As soon as the Joker is reintroduced, the real story begins. Like in Arkham Asylum, you spend most of the game bouncing from one villain to the next. You're never very far from another memorable adversary. Hugo Strange is the central antagonist from a plot standpoint, but once again, the Joker is the heart of the game, and in a much more compelling way than the first. Arkham Asylum was a well-told Batman vs. Joker story that could have fit into many eras of the comic books with different versions of those characters. The universality was its appeal. This Batman-Joker story is a direct continuation that turns it into something much more unique. I wasn't a big fan of the Titan plot in Arkham Asylum, particularly the final boss fight against a giant steroid-enhanced Joker, but Arkham City gives that plot long-term consequences that retroactively make Arkham Asylum better. The Joker's Titan usage has left him sick. In fact, he's dying. His blood has been poisoned by too much of the stuff. Naturally, the Joker ships off a bunch of his bad blood to area hospitals, and then gives Batman a transfusion too. Now saddled with the same terminal disease as his arch nemesis, Batman must find a cure. That's a powerful ticking clock for this story, and a much more compelling main objective than before. Batman's deteriorating health adds a huge amount of weight to the narrative. Although it almost never directly affects the gameplay, he starts showing signs of the affliction. Longtime allies and enemies react in a way that underscores the dire nature of the situation. Even if the audience doesn't believe for one second that Batman's life is in danger, everyone in the story behaves like it's a real possibility. It's interesting to see Batman pushed to his limits in this way. His primary concern isn't his own life, but saving Gotham. He's got even less time for games than usual, but there's still a parade of villains standing in his way. Arkham City is the first game in the franchise to include full-fledged side missions instead of just collectible extras. Riddler's trophies and challenges return here, but this time there's a little more to it. At certain collection thresholds, you'll acquire the location of a hostage which you can go rescue from sort of escape room death traps. I've never had the patience to track down all the Riddler collectibles, I'm just not typically a completionist. Fortunately, the other side missions are much more manageable in their scopes, for the better. 
None of them feel like the sort of copy-pasted filler activities that were and still are common in open world games. And that's another reason I hesitate to give Arkham City that label. Even the more repetitive ones have a sense of progression to them. This is not content for the sake of content. Most side quests center on bringing down a particular villain not featured in the main story. Others grant optional gadgets. The most valuable bonus tool comes from completing Batman's own augmented reality challenges. If you're able to prove your gliding skill, you're rewarded with the Grapnel Boost, an upgrade to the Grapnel Gun that allows you to slingshot Batman directly into the air. Normally, I skip optional challenges like this because they have so little personality. The Grapnel Boost is more than worth it. It's so fun and so useful that I'm surprised it wasn't rolled into the critical path. In subsequent games, it became a standard part of Batman's loadout, which was necessary with increasingly bigger maps. A common issue with side quests in a lot of games is that they conflict with the urgency of the main plot. The more you take it seriously, the less you feel you have time for side quests, especially if, like me on my first playthrough, you think there might actually be a real-time component to the story. Fortunately, you can keep playing Arkham City during the post-game and do any optional activity you want. There's one side mission that might attract even the most focused players during the main story. Fairly late in the game, when you're especially desperate for the Titan disease cure, a side mission marker appears on the map with a message from Alfred, saying that Lucius Fox has come up with a cure and sent it to the marked location. This is clearly fishy. Such an important plot point wouldn't be relegated to a side mission, would it? It's a clever way to get players to bite, though. Obviously, it ends up being a fake, despite the convincing delivery method. Batman passes out and wakes up hypnotized by Jervis Tetch, the Mad Hatter. I would call him one of the stranger Batman villains, but they're all pretty strange, aren't they? It's just that most of them aren't weirdly fixated on classic literature. Mad Hatter's mission is the closest thing to the Scarecrow segments from Arkham Asylum. It plays out in a hallucination, with the fight being representative of Batman breaking free from the villain's control. It's not quite as effective as Scarecrow, but it benefits from being unexpected and unique in this game. It's probably the best example of how much bespoke art and craft went into the completely optional content. Other missions make good use of the overworld map's increased size. Serial killer Victor Zaz calls random payphones around the city. Getting from payphone to payphone within the time limit is a test of your traversal skills. After you've done this enough, you're able to trace his call and confront the man himself. Several side missions are cast as detective stories. The main story has a few moments of detective work with the evidence scanner. It functions essentially the same as in the first game. Scan something, then look for a path to follow. The problem with the detective elements in the main games is that they don't have time to build up intrigue. The gameplay is very basic. It asks little of the player, but the context around it also does nothing to create a sense of mystery. It's entirely forensic and functional. These side missions provide the missing mystery. They're much better at conveying the detective flavor without actually giving the mechanics more depth. The assassin Deadshot snipes targets around Arkham City. By finding his victims and tracing the bullet trajectory, you piece together clues about the perpetrator and his whereabouts. Another series of murders leaves victims with damaged faces wrapped in bandages. As you find more bodies, Bruce Wayne's fingerprints turn up at the scene of the crime. Witnesses confirm seeing the billionaire in the vicinity of the murders. It's apparent these aren't random killings, they're done with purpose and precision. The killer's identity is revealed when you locate his hideout. Dr. Thomas Elliot, going by the name Hush, has been killing victims and salvaging body parts in order to surgically modify himself into a doppelganger of Bruce Wayne. His purpose in doing this is left vague. Both Hush and another side mission character, Asriel, have their stories concluded in the chronological sequel, Arkham Knight. If the other side stories didn't feel more conclusive, this might be irritating. Instead, it's an effective way of building the world across games. At their best, that's what these side missions do, flesh out the world of the Arkhamverse, making it feel bigger and more alive than it would by simply sticking to the main story. Arkham City doesn't reach the heights of the most memorable villain sequences from Arkham Asylum. There's nothing that quite matches the surprise of Scarecrow encounters or the dread of creeping through Killer Croc's lair. 
but Arkham City provides a more even experience with better gameplay while still being an excellent showcase of its villains. Oswald Cobblepot, the Penguin, is introduced right at the start of the game while you're playing as Bruce Wayne. The Cobblepots were old money in Gotham. Penguin blames the Waynes for his family's fall from grace, so despite not knowing the two are one and the same, he has reason to hate both Batman and Bruce Wayne. The Penguin is delightfully hateable because his sadism is the product of a sound mind instead of a mentally unstable one, like so many of Batman's other villains. The caricatured portrayal of ugly, naked greed and selfishness is less scary than some of the other foes, but more immediately recognizable. Cobblepot has had misfortune in his life, and he's multiplied and reflected all of that ugliness back into the world. The game makes no attempt to present his plight as sympathetic. He's just pathetic. He's a great comic book villain for these reasons, but not the sort you can make into a boss fight. Penguin goes down in one powerful hit from Batman, as he should. The trick is getting to him. That involves shutting down jammers around the city, traipsing through a frozen museum complete with a giant killer shark, and rescuing Mr. Freeze so he can assist Batman in disabling the ice gun Penguin stole from him. After going through all those barriers, it's very satisfying landing that uppercut on Penguin's smug chin. But then the real boss of this segment is revealed. Solomon Grundy is the weirdest element of the comics that the Arkham series has used up until this point. Everything in Arkham Asylum could be more or less explained by the kind of fast and loose science fiction that's a staple of comic books. The spirit of Arkham collectibles dipped a toe into the supernatural, but that was an optional part of the game. Solomon Grundy is a hundred plus year old giant zombie housed underneath the Penguin's iceberg lounge. There's no sciencing that away. Comic book continuity is an odd thing. You get writers with many different approaches and interests over a period of time, and that means Batman has fought everything from down-to-earth street criminals to multi-dimensional gods, because 80 years is a long time in which to tell stories about one character. There are advantages to limiting what's possible with your story, but you also get some pretty wild stuff when you leave the door completely open. When it comes to comic book fiction, Believability and realism isn't the point. To me, it matters much more whether something fits in tonally. And in that regard, Solomon Grundy works. His morbid story befits the Gotham presented in the Arkham series. As a boss fight though, he's a glorified tutorial. Grundy is strengthened by three electrified nodes. While dodging attacks, you have to blow them up. The only way to do that fast enough is to quick fire the explosive gel. Mostly what you're doing in this fight is dodging attacks while spamming explosive gel and hoping you're close enough to one of the conduits to blow it up. It's not exactly elegant, but it works. And the explosive gel is an especially useful tool for managing larger crowds of enemies later in the game, so making sure the player learns about it here is ultimately beneficial. I'd rate Grundy as the least engaging boss fight. Not bad, but not interesting either. It's definitely an improvement over the worst that Asylum had to offer. Fortunately, the bosses of Arkham City only get better from here. Following Solomon Grundy, we have more encounters with the strange and supernatural. In order to make the cure, Batman needs a sample of blood from Ra's al Ghul, the 600-year-old leader of the League of Assassins, who's been kept alive through the regenerative powers of Lazarus Pits. Batman tracks a ninja assassin back to al Ghul's lair under Arkham City. While his presence there might seem a convenient contrivance, there are good plot-related reasons for this, which are revealed later. By the time you arrive, Batman is on death's doorstep. To survive, he makes a deal with Raish's daughter Talia. Batman and Talia were lovers in the past, and there are still feelings there, even if this night is a bad time to explore them. Raish had wanted them to be together so they could jointly succeed him, but as you can imagine, Batman turned down leading a group with the word assassin in the title. Now desperate and dying, he tells Talia that he's ready to join her as her father's successor. Doing this grants Batman access to a cup of the Lazarus substance that will preserve his life for long enough to continue working on a cure. But in order to succeed Raish, he must be willing to take a life. Before meeting Raish, you must complete the Trials of the Demon, a series of gliding and combat challenges that take place in a hallucinatory dreamscape brought on by drinking the Lazarus substance. 
Ra's al Ghul is a very different type of villain from any we saw in Arkham Asylum. He's a dangerous ideologue. His goals could be considered noble and selfless, but his methods are uncompromisingly brutal. Like many of Batman's villains, Raish can be seen as a dark mirror of the hero, a vigilante who doesn't restrain himself with rules like no killing, a man whose prescribed cure for society is worse than the disease. Of course, Batman refuses to kill Raish. He only needs a sample of his blood to formulate the cure, but Al Ghul offers all of it. When Batman refuses, the decrepit old man plunges himself into the Lazarus Pit and re-emerges youthful, revitalized, and ready to fight to the death. The fight takes place in the same sort of dreamscape as the Trials of the Demon. This allows things to be more varied and creative than a simple duel between these characters in the real world. The fight switches between a giant, singular representation of Raish and a brawl with a legion of ninjas. In this way, it plays to the strengths of Arkham's combat systems while still befitting the featured villain. It's also a trial run of the final boss. Some of the rhythms you'll learn here will come in handy again at the end of the game. Up to this point, it's the best boss fight in the whole series because the gameplay is varied and consistently engaging, while also featuring some great visual spectacle. Once defeated, Raish takes Talia hostage, threatening to kill her if Batman doesn't finish the job and take his place. Batman refuses again, frees Talia, and gets his blood sample. Now, it's up to Victor Freeze to finish the cure. Of all the villains in the game, Mr. Freeze is treated with the most empathy. Paul Dini, one of the game's writers, was responsible for creating what became the widely accepted backstory of the character in an episode of Batman the Animated Series. Freeze is cast as a tragic figure. Despite the misfortunes experienced by most of the villains, they're not usually afforded a sympathetic eye. Freeze does what he does to help his terminally ill wife, and to take revenge on those who sabotaged his previous efforts to cure her. It's easy to see why Batman might have a bit of a soft spot for the character, since familial bonds are also integral to his motivation. Freeze isn't like the other villains. He's willing to negotiate and work with Batman to a degree. And in this story, his particular set of skills are especially useful. But Freeze is an uncertain ally. After completing the cure, he refuses to hand it over until Batman locates his cryogenically frozen wife. Mr. Freeze is genuinely scary in this confrontation. Up until this point, you've seen the man in more vulnerable positions. You've seen his human side. But in the space of just a few seconds, he goes from man to killer robot. This is him in full Terminator mode, and he is reminiscent of the original Terminator with his slow but determined movement, creepy robot voice, and chilling singular focus. Taking Freeze on directly is too dangerous, so you have to use every stealth trick you know to get the drop on him, do some damage, and then escape to repeat the process until he's finished. This is the best boss encounter in the entire Arkham series. Most bosses make use of gadgets or the free flow combat system, but this one is based on Predator mode. It's a true test of your stealth abilities. Freeze is a formidable foe with a plethora of technology that nearly matches Batman's own. In a normal Predator encounter, Batman does the hunting, but in this fight, each hunts the other. Evading Mr. Freeze is an active process. No hiding place is safe for long. You have to keep moving. Vantage points are unavailable from the start, and your options only diminish as you progress in the fight. Each takedown method can only be used once before Freeze learns and adapts his tactics. If you've been relying on the same moves over and over, this will stretch you. But if you've learned to use a variety of takedowns, this is a chance to prove how good you are. Unfortunately for Batman, by the time the fight is over, Harley Quinn has stolen the cure, so it's finally time to confront the Joker once more. Upon returning to the steel mill, Joker has seemingly been cured. Batman's only hope is to make the clown hand over the rest. You fight him in a group brawl that's much more thematically appropriate than the giant Joker fight from Arkham Asylum. After the fight, Batman is incapacitated under falling debris. It's not well conveyed in this scene, but that was the opening salvo of Protocol 10, a shot fired to take Batman specifically out of the fight. Unfortunately, it reads as a stupidly random occurrence as presented. Talia appears and offers Joker the secret of immortality in exchange for Batman's life. It's clear that these two don't know each other well. Each is trying to take advantage of the other. 
With Batman trapped, but alive for now, the game cuts to the final Catwoman sequence of the main story. Her objective the whole game has been to break into Hugo Strange's maximum security vault and make off with whatever valuables she finds there. By the time she does that, Batman has become trapped. Selina has to make a choice, take the money and run, or sacrifice it to save Batman. You can actually leave Arkham City and get a false alternate ending, complete with a credits roll and a radio play from Barbara Gordon describing the horrible aftermath of Batman's death. Of course, Catwoman does the right thing and saves Batman. But then, instead of sticking around to help with the imminent threat, she exits the story. The idea of Selina being torn between thief and hero isn't explored here or anywhere in the game. She's a selfish actor. The primary reason we're given for her helping Batman is attraction rather than any moral considerations. It's a real missed opportunity to engage with the character on anything more than a surface level. Hugo Strange is a lingering presence in the background of Arkham City. He appears on screens and over loudspeakers, his deep, unsettling voice reminding inmates of how little their lives mean in his prison. He also regularly updates us on the status of Protocol 10. On my initial playthrough, I thought the countdown might actually be real time. It begins at 10 hours, and that's about how long it took on my first go-round. Of course, it's a scripted event, but not knowing that for sure, not even knowing what Protocol 10 is, adds another source of urgency to the proceedings. It turns out Protocol 10 is a mass execution of prisoners. When Strange gives the order, those looming helicopters turn their considerable firepower on the inmates. This isn't the usual kind of big threat you get in mainstream superhero tales. Stopping Protocol 10 isn't about saving average citizens or saving Gotham in a general symbolic sense. It's about rescuing the unjust from injustice. Sure, there are some innocents in Arkham City, but the vast majority are violent criminals, Batman's enemies. That's a more morally mature and compelling idea than the usual save the city scenario. One of my favorite scenes in the whole series happens here, right at the start of Protocol 10. Oracle. Strange is launching missile strikes on Arkham City from Wonder Tower. You shut this place down. Joker's taken Talia. I'm going after them. You can't. Hundreds will be killed. I need your help to stop the attack. He'll kill Talia. You need to think this through. Batman can't let all these people die. My tracker's not activating. Reroute all Wayne Tech satellites to boost the signal. I can't do that. I realize it is difficult, Sam. But you need to decide if one life is worth sacrificing to save a thousand. Don't do this, Alfred. Batman must save Gotham. I'm sorry, but deep down, you know I'm right. I love this scene because of how it humanizes the central character. The Arkham series, apart from Origins, portrays an older, steadier Batman. It rarely presents Batman in an unflattering light. He's gotten beyond the foolish, hot-headed behavior of his earlier years. But this scene shows some very relatable human flaws that strengthen the character substantially. The impulse to prioritize Talia, one life that he cares about over hundreds or thousands of impersonal lives, is Bruce Wayne talking. That's the flesh and blood man, not the ideal of Batman. Alfred referring to Batman in the third person here is a reminder that he's ultimately a constructed symbol resulting from their collaboration. It takes Alfred, his conscience and father figure, to remind Bruce of his obligation to the greater good. This emphasizes the importance of Batman's support system. They're not just voices on the radio offering tactical support. They're friends, they're family. Without them, he wouldn't be the best version of himself. In order to stop Protocol 10, Batman must confront Hugo Strange at the top of Wonder Tower. The path there is a fantastic trek through the flurry of explosions, fires, and searchlights that Arkham City has become. This was an impressive spectacle in 2011, and it still looks good today. You've spent the whole game traveling all over Arkham City. Its transformation into an all-out war zone is a powerful visual. As you ascend the tower, you get your best view of Arkham City and Gotham yet. Wonder Tower is a spectacular set piece, and more than that, it provides a unique setting for gameplay. 
At the top, you're met with one of the trickiest predator sequences in the game. The interior space is cramped compared to most arenas. The only overhead vantage points are on the outside perimeter of the tower. You can use these to pick off a couple guards, but since they tend to congregate inside, you'll likely need to weave in and out of the tower choosing your openings carefully. It's more dangerous and tense than most stealth sequences, despite not using any special enemy types. They say the best villains think they're the hero. Hugo Strange truly believes he's doing the right thing. The passcode to his door is Gotham's savior. But in the end, he's not even the real mastermind behind Arkham City and Protocol 10. That was Ra's Shao Ghoul, working from the shadows. That's why he was conveniently operating under Arkham City. Ra's has always wanted to wipe out the criminal element. Strange and Arkham City was just a new way to do it. Strange was next in line to lead the League of Assassins. Since he failed his assignment, he gets a sword through the chest instead. The differences between these men and Batman could not be more apparent in this scene. All want to stop crime, bring justice, and make the world a better, safer place. They disagree sharply on what that means and how to get there. Strange and Al Ghul rounded their enemies up for slaughter. They seek to cleanse the world of evil, wiping it out despite the collateral damage, despite individual capacity for change and the value of life itself. Batman abhors crime just as much. It's not that Batman doesn't sometimes want to kill, but he's well aware of Nietzsche's aphorism about fighting monsters. All I've ever wanted to do is kill him. A day doesn't go by when I don't think about subjecting him to every horrendous torture he's dealt out to others, and then end him. Aw, oh, so you do think about me. But if I do that, if I allow myself to go down into that place, I'll never come back. Batman's no-kill rule has just as much to do with containing his own dark impulses as it does with the pain from his parents' deaths. Instead of flirting with his line in the sand, Batman leans into saving people, even saving criminals and supervillains. He may use violent force to stop them. He may work outside the law. He'll play judge and sometimes jury, but never executioner. He even tries to save Ra's al Ghul when Strange activates the tower's self-destruct. Both villains end up dead, but for Ra's, it could just be a momentary inconvenience. With Protocol 10 shut down, Batman can turn his attention back to the more personal problems at hand. The final mission of the game leads you back to the Monarch Theater. What's impressive is how this manages to feel climactic and important despite immediately following the explosive, bombastic climax of the Protocol 10 storyline. Effectively, Arkham City has an A plot and a B plot. Protocol 10 is introduced first and initially presented as the A plot. It's the impetus for Batman being in Arkham City. It's the plot with a more widespread impact in universe. But in fact, it's really the B plot. The A plot, the story with far more weight for Batman and Batman fans, is what's going on with the Joker. This is the personal story, smaller in scope, larger in meaning. During this story, the Joker has gone from terminally ill to being on the cusp of achieving relative immortality thanks to the promise of the Lazarus Pits. Talia never intended to give a man like the Joker the keys to Ra's al Ghul's kingdom, but she underestimated the clown. There are a lot of revelations in this scene, and it's a credit to the writing and direction that it isn't a confusing mess. It works as intended, a series of climactic twists that explain the oddities you've been seeing throughout the game. The Joker has looked alternately sick on the verge of death, and completely normal depending on the scene, sometimes even changing appearances during the same scene. Did he already take the cure? Has he been faking illness the whole time? No. Talia stole the cure back from Harley Quinn. Joker never had a chance to take it. We all fell for the old fake Joker gag. There were two Jokers, the real dying Joker and the healthy looking perfect copy played by the shape-shifting Clayface. They switched places throughout the story just to mess with Batman and keep up appearances with his henchmen. The real Joker shoots and kills Talia just as Batman works it all out. It's a great reveal. These villains are employed so well in service of the story. 
Joker's most effective dramatic function isn't to kill and cause mayhem, it's to torment Batman. He's done that psychologically with the fake Joker shenanigans, and he's done it physically with his poisoned blood. I love that you never actually fight the Joker in this game. The earlier brawl was with the Clayface Joker, and this final boss fight is against Clayface in his natural form. Clayface is like a more difficult, remixed version of the Ra's al Ghul fight. In the first two stages, you have to throw freeze blasts at his giant monstrous form while dodging attacks. After that, Joker blows the floor of the theater. Batman and Clayface fall several stories underground right into Ra's al Ghul's Lazarus Pit chamber. In the final stage, Clayface divides himself into an army of mudmen. Armed with Talia's sword, Batman takes each in one strike. They're trivial to fight, but their numbers are overwhelming, and they keep coming. I like how monstrous Clayface is. There's an element of body horror to his grotesque appearance. His face wears this agonized expression, as if he's constantly in pain. The way he shapeshifts is both disgusting and visually interesting. It's an exciting, engaging fight that's a massive improvement over the giant Joker final boss of the first game, and one of the best of its kind in the whole series. With Clayface defeated, Batman finally takes the cure. Joker tries to get to the Lazarus Pit, opting for immortality instead, but Batman destroys it. Then, this happens. Quick! The cure! What are you waiting for? Come on! I killed your girlfriend, poisoned Gotham in hell! <laughs> it's not even breakfast! <laughs> but so what? We all know you'll save me. Every decision you've ever made ends with death and misery. People die. I stop you. You'll just break out and do it again. <laughs> Think of it as a running no! Are you happy now? Do you want to know something funny? Even after everything you've done, I would have saved you. <laughs> you know, that actually is pretty funny. Killing the Joker was, and still is, a big deal. Once shocking and revolutionary ideas like Barbara Gordon being crippled by the Joker, or Jason Todd being tortured and turned to the dark side, are no longer surprises for Batman fans. They're regular features of the greater mythos. But killing the Joker isn't likely to become commonplace. While the character has been killed off in a number of notable stories during Batman's long history, those deaths haven't been adopted into the canon the same way that other shocking stories have. The Joker is Batman's oldest and most iconic villain, one that stood the test of time just as well as the Dark Knight himself. But it wasn't just the history of Batman and the Joker that made this scene so impactful. By 2011, this set of voice actors, Kevin Conroy as Batman and Mark Hamill as the Joker, had been playing these roles opposite each other for almost 20 years often working with writer Paul Dini. The veterancy of this creative team brings a lot to this scene, even for audiences like me, less familiar and less reverent of their previous work. This ending works even better because Arkham Asylum by itself was so inconsequential. That game was content to reset everything back to the status quo at the end. Batman flew off into the night to chase down his next criminal like the events of the story were no big deal. I expected the same for Arkham City. 
it was unthinkable that they'd actually kill off a character as lovably hateable as the Joker. But they did, and it works. We know that Batman and Gotham City won't be leaving this story unchanged. This will leave a mark. The status quo has changed forever. As great an ending as this is, it's also deeply flawed by the text of the story. Batman carries the Joker out of Arkham City. The Joker, his arch enemy. Talia al Ghul, the woman he loved, he leaves on the debris-ridden floor of the Monarch Theater. I didn't notice this the first time I played the game. I think they wanted you not to notice because once you think about it, the emotional logic of the scene falls apart. It's often a problem in fiction that the main character and the audience have vastly different relationships with supporting characters. Batman's relationship with Talia was mostly off screen, while the Joker has been the main antagonist for two games, to say nothing of his prevalence in pop culture. So while Batman is closer to Talia, in many versions of the story, she's the mother of his son, the audience cares more about the Joker and Batman's relationship. If Batman had carried Talia's body out of Arkham City instead of the Joker's, well, it wouldn't have landed with nearly the same impact for the audience. It would have been a mistake. Unfortunately, this is also a mistake. It's just one that feels right if you forget about Talia, and the framing of the scene makes that easy to do. I think it was a mistake to have Talia die at all. The previous scene doesn't need her death to have a weight and emotional significance. In fact, it glosses over her death in the midst of the Clayface Joker reveal. Even just one or two shots at the end could have smoothed this over. Have Talia's ninjas take her body away and Batman nod at them sorrowfully. Just something that acknowledged her at all. Talia is introduced and discarded by the story in a way that's kind of callous when you look at how the series treats women generally. They're almost universally subject to the male gaze. Their sex appeal is the focus to the detriment of their character or agency in the story. This is an issue with much of the source material as well. It's not that these characters can't be appealing, but I strongly believe this would be a better game if Catwoman zipped that suit up a little higher and Talia didn't fall victim to so many tropes surrounding exotic foreign women. I can ignore this issue and have a good time with this series. I can ignore it and see the otherwise great execution of this ending, but I understand why that would be difficult for some players. It is a real problem, and acting like it isn't just because the scene is otherwise excellent does a disservice to everyone. Despite that, it's easy to see why this ending resonated so powerfully with fans, from the serious to the casual. Arkham Knight would deal with the specific impact of the Joker's death. This game merely leaves you with the statement itself. The Joker is dead. That's more than enough. The DLC mission Harley Quinn's Revenge serves as an epilogue for the main story. Harley, now in mourning for the Joker, kidnaps some GCPD officers as bait for Batman. It's not as if she had a clever plan to capture him though. She just shoots at a cop and Batman jumps in the way. Even though he gets shot all the time, this knocks him out. I don't know, I guess it was an extra big gun. Two days later, Robin goes in looking for Batman. Playing as the famous sidekick, albeit the Tim Drake version rather than the more widely known Dick Grayson, was the big selling point of the DLC. He showed up all too briefly in the main game. In Harley Quinn's Revenge, you spend about half the time playing him and the rest is Batman. That's an odd decision, because aside from Robin, there's not a lot of truly new content in this package. The mission takes place entirely in and around the steel mill, which was Joker's base of operations in the main game. It's a place you've already visited several times in the main story, more if you completed all the side missions. This DLC has you running around the exterior as Batman, then going through some of the same interior areas as both Batman and Robin. The slight redressing of sets and characters isn't enough to make up for all the repetition. Playing Robin the whole time would have helped it feel like a fresher experience. The best part about playing as Robin are his unique gadgets. There's the bullet shield, which does exactly what you'd expect, but it's also useful for getting around other hazards. The snap flash is an explosive device that can be placed on enemies and sometimes other objects to knock them down. Robin's replacement for the bat claw is the zip kick, which pulls the player toward the object instead of the other way around. 
These all get used in some clever ways, but your time as Robin is too short to develop the new mechanics much more than that. The main draw, then, aside from playable Robin, is getting a glimpse at the post-Joker world. But we don't learn much here. Batman is sad. Harley Quinn is sad. She's trying to kill Batman, who she blames for her beloved Mr. J's death. But her actions don't cast her as a credible threat. Part of the problem is the nature of DLC itself. You know nothing of major consequence will happen in a mission that only a fraction of players ever see. They just killed off the Joker. You know they're not going to kill Batman or Harley Quinn or Robin here. So why even have the story suggest that? From a gameplay standpoint, there are some pretty good challenging fights toward the end. But to get there, you have to go through some tediously structured segments. It's still Arkham. It's still good. But it could have been better in some obvious ways. It might make a decent snack but it's an underwhelming dessert when consumed right after the excellent main course. But what a main course it was. Batman Arkham City is one of my favorite games of all time. It's among my most replayed games. These days, I don't tend to revisit games much, but I'll almost certainly keep coming back to this one. It's something special. Even in games I love, there are usually parts I'm not so thrilled to replay boring or frustrating elements that get in the way of otherwise great experiences. Arkham City, for me, doesn't have that issue. It may stumble at times with its narrative delivery, but as a game, the parts you play, it's uniformly excellent. Some casual fans looked at Arkham City as simply more of the same. Good, but not nearly as special as Arkham Asylum. I disagree wholeheartedly. You can't take from Asylum the distinction of being first, but Arkham City does it better across the board. It does things Arkham Asylum never even attempted, like telling a bold, consequential Batman story and letting the Dark Knight loose in a sprawling, urban environment. As the sequel to a game that so masterfully established a new winning formula, it had a lot to live up to. And as the next game would show, simply copying past successes without fully understanding them doesn't guarantee the kind of brilliance abundant in Batman Arkham City. 